How are we feeling? Hot? <laughs> yes? <laughs> exactly. It's really warm in here. So I'm, uh, I'm Raul, and uh, this is uh, Valentin. Nice Great. And um, let's pick a volunteer. You, sir. What's your name? Dennis. Dennis. Fantastic. So Dennis is going to be a volunteer today. So Dennis, have you ever been, you know, to like a, a fancy dinner with your boss? And you need to sound smart really quickly. Do you know that situation? You know, you want to pay a rise and kind of need something to say. Don't worry, Dennis. We've got you back. Today, it's all about the buzzwords, things that make you sound smart, things like Spark, Hadoop, you know, EMR. Who knows what that even means? It makes you sound smart. So, you know, that's for the situations. Okay. So, very buzzword compliant, uh, Valentin, today. Yeah, that's right. We uh, decided that. We didn't just want to stop at big data, because everyone talks about big data, and we wanted to take it to the next level. So we got humongous data, you know? We can take IBM, you know, the marketing department from IBM has nothing on us. We got humongous data, okay? So, um, but more seriously, you know, before we, we start off, we're going to talk about big data, but what do you guys think is the first big data system that was maybe created? And yeah, it is. Dennis, come on, you must have ideas, Dennis. Regular file systems. Regular file systems? Okay. Let's go a bit more back in time, I think. It's the human. Library of someone, Alexandria. someone has looked at a slide. <laughs> <laughs> so the Library of Alexandria is the answer. Right. <laughs> DNA. DNA. That, that's yeah, a we good have one. To, we have to say it's the human created as opposed to evolution created. Created Indeed. So the Library of Alexandria is really interesting. It could store about 400,000 papyrus scrolls. I love that word. And um, across 60,000 square meters. So that's huge. It's probably the first real system where you could kind of structure data and query it, even though it's really, really slow. But some estimates say that it's about 4 gigabyte to 40 gigabyte of data. If you do a kind of multiplication of 20 pages, papyrus scrolls, and then you multiply, you get about 40 gigabyte of data. Not bad, not bad. So, what we're going to do in this talk is to first start off and give some background on what big data is, what it's all about, and what we care for 10 minutes. And then we're going to get our hands dirty with uh, something really cool called Spark. Nothing to do with Cambridge Spark, I just want to mention. It's an it's a open source project created by smart people. Um, and then we're going to look at how we can scale uh, some basic file processing, some data processing questions on the cloud. So, who has watched Fast and Furious? Raise your hand. There's no need to be ashamed. You know. <laughs> it's a safe environment here. It's okay. It stays in this room. So, Vin Diesel brought us the awesome Fast and Furious series. But he also brought us Triple X, which we rebranded to Triple Vs. And that's what really big data has three characteristics really that people talk about. There's the volume, the velocity, and the variety aspects of big data. So, what's the volume about? So, you know, volume is something quite, quite simple to, to think about. It's things that are stored uh, on computers. So if we think about Facebook, you know, Dennis, do you use Facebook? Do you like to get a cheeky selfie now and then? <laughs> <laughs> With your boss as well? <laughs> no? All right, so if we think about Facebook, you know, there's uh, even two billion users now. And let's say the daily average contribution is one megabyte of data, okay? If you do a multiplication here, you end up having more than 300 petabytes of information for a single year, right? So in sort of a data center, you get over 300 petabytes of information. It's, that's not even counting things like replication. So volume is a big issue from an infrastructure point of view. And a good way to think about this is that, well, I don't have enough space on my machine here, so I'm going to have to partner with something else, like another computer, maybe with Dennis, you know? I've got too much information here. I'm going to share some information with you. You know, let's, let's split the work. But I bring some issues in terms of coordination and processing. So suddenly, we have to decide who's going to do what. And I don't know, Dennis, yesterday, did you go for a drink? Yeah. So maybe you have a hangover, you're down, you know, and I can't rely on you anymore. So we have to deal with full tolerance as well, right? When we think about <laughs> machines going down. So quite a lot of engineering issues with volume in one time. What about velocity? What's that all about? So, as, so we saw volume. I was just you have too much data, and it, it's worth noting like 
all of the things we're noticing here, volume, velocity, uh, variety, these are issues. These are things we have to tackle. So velocity is another issue. And it's the idea that I just have too much data coming in at once. So it's really the speed at which data is coming in. I don't even have to pr time to process it, to filter it, to make sure like maybe most of it I don't care about, but even doing that computation is too much, or rather is a challenge. And here there's some really interesting uh, examples of what's happening you know, in industry. Uh, Twitter, you know, they, they, they've released some statistics, about 3,000 images per second that are kind of being shared. So you know, if you think about it, that's a lot of selfies. That's a lot of selfies out there. Uh, but WhatsApp, you know, the company that was, was quite for billions of dollars, processes 60 billion messages per day. So again, that puts quite a lot of challenges from a, an infrastructure point of view. So you don't got Dennis, hey, I'm going to fire lots of data at you. You know, you're going to be like, great, great. And that's when you got that say, you know, I can't handle it anymore. So we've got challenges from a producer point of view and producing information, and Dennis is trying to consume it. There is too much of it. You know, suddenly we need a, another Dennis, right? We need to replicate some Dennis's, right? So we've got multiple consumers that can handle the velocity of the information. And the final thing is variety. Who has used Excel spreadsheets before? Come on. <laughs> and it's a safe environment, guys. We all love it. Do you like it? Uh, I wouldn't say I'm the biggest fan of it's the biggest but, but you know, Excel spreadsheets have something great about it. It's a really simple model to think of, right? Some columns, some rows, easy to access the data, easy to update it and think about your, your data. It's related to what relational databases provide us. So things like MySQL, PostgreSQL, they kind of shape up the data in forms of a table with columns and rows. So very easy to think of. But not all data fits in a two-dimensional table. So he, he, who works for a global company, maybe with offices in UK, you know, everyone around the world, exactly. So think about how you model a payroll system, sounds exciting, right, for a global company. Uh, in UK, we've got the PAYE scheme, we've got contractors. In Japan, it'll be something completely different, different attributes, different tax codes. So there isn't really a simple way to unify how you model a payroll system for every country, right? It's like mission impossible. If you manage, you probably are going to become really rich. But again, that's the kind of stuff that gets updated over time. You know, new government, new schemes. So that kind of data and that schema has to evolve. So it's really hard to unify that. And we've got different kind of data structures that don't really fit in a two-dimensional table at all, right? Things like uh, uh, a map, right? How do you store that into a 2D table? Yeah, that's right. Just because, like, you have some sort of geographical structure, there there is some sort of way in which it's sort of uh, I mean, just putting in a two D table is kind of not the right format. But then something like a network, so you know, Dennis, we're best buddies now, but you know, we've got other friends. So how do we model some kind of relationship as a graph? You know, in a two D table, it'd be quite difficult to reason about it and query that in a simple way. So. You know, we, we looked a little around the, the internet, you know, what are all those big data technologies available that handle the volume, the velocity, and the variety content. And it turns out it's quite an impressive space. It's a pretty scary graphic here. But there's the good news. There's the good news. Dennis, if you want to be a big data consultant, you're going to make a lot of money because no one understands it. It's really scary. <laughs> right, so that's a great career here. Um, and what we want to do in this talk is to really classify two kinds of business problems. So we get a bit of an idea of what kind of uh, problems we have. So the first one is batch processing. What batch processing really means is that we've got some data, you know, rest, and we need to process it and make good use of resources available. So something like calculating a payroll, it's a monthly job, you've got all your data, you process it. Okay, Valentin, you've done a lot of machine learning. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so, like, if I'm trying to uh, trade my neural network to detect whether it's seeing cats or dogs, probably I have this one big data set, and I'm just going to train it all at once and try to process, uh, to train it in order to detect uh, what's in the image. But it's all like there's not going to be images coming in throughout the training, and I'm trying to update it because of these new images. Uh, I'll, I'll just be like, there'll be one static process. Another example hey, who works for a financial organization? It's a safe environment, guys. Yes, a couple of hats. It's London. Um, you know, I'm sure you all love regulation uh, and regulatory reports, right? So that's again, that's kind of a batch processing job because you've got all your trades that you've logged, and then you have to issue some reports. So that's again, take all your data, 
who says it. Okay? So from an architectural point of view, you know, this is kind of a how to visualize it, right? You've got a storage, all the data is stored there. Then you've got this batch processing here that takes it, processing gives you a result. So you're not really concerned about the latency of the equations, how fast you provide the result. What you're really concerned about here is making good use of resources available. So the throughput is what's important. Okay? But the other side of the story is screen processing. So that's the idea that the data uh, is coming in motion and you need to process it now. So you're concerned with the latency of the operation. So for example, you know, if you've got a payment system, you need to be able to tell whether the transaction that is about to be processed, whether it's fraudulent or not. So that's a real time concern. That's what we screen processing it is uh, about. So whether an email is spam or not, whether a trade uh, is uh, consistent or not, that's kind of stream processing type of operation. And the architecture behind it is that now you don't really have this uh, intermediate uh, data storage. You could have some kind of queue and some pub sub mechanism here. But really what you want to do is process this data in motion and uh, provide the result. Okay. So what we're going to do in the rest of this talk is to focus on the batch processing aspect of uh, problems. Before we do that, let's check how we're doing. So here's a little quiz, and we've got some prices for you guys. So the first one, general balance sheet from all the invoices in a month. Do we think that's a batch processing operation or a stream processing operation? Batch? Awesome, awesome. What about the second one, real-time alerts? Stream. 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 Isn't that great over here? Awesome. Ah, the third one's a bit more tricky. What do you think about the third one? Batch. Batch? That's a views Valentine. You, you did some research with the page rank at some point. Yeah, so like I agree it's batch. Uh, and that's but it should be noted that the reason it's batch isn't so much because uh, of the computation the computation itself is intris intrinsically batch. We do have data that's coming in all the time, like maybe our graph of web pages is changing all the time. It's only because the rate at which at which these uh, this new information is coming is so high, there's no way we could put possibly processing the stream anymore. So what we do is we just aggregate it, and every hour, say, we can do a new batch of, uh, we, can, we do the, this batch computation again, and give the page, page rank again. But ideally, it'd be a stream computation. Indeed. And the last one? Stream, stream processing. Awesome. So again, what we're going to do now is to focus on the batch processing aspect. So Valentin, here I've got some big data for you. What are you going to do with it? Good question. So now we're going to switch from before we're kind of talking about the challenges, so like what kind of processing we're trying to do. Now we're talking about um, how we actually, how, how are things implemented. So say I've got my laptop and I've got some uh, Python program on it, say on Skidlearn, which uh, does some data analysis. But now this laptop, and this is my little machine here, is too slow. So I have to remedy this. Let's go bigger. Let's go more power. So yeah, one way, one thing that I can do is scale up. And this method is used a lot of the time. Uh, I just buy this one machine that is a lot bigger. And there's an alternative to this, which is has sort of been pioneered by Google uh, in, I'd, I'd say like 2004 is when, 2003, 2004 is when they started pushing papers about this. Where instead you're scaling out. And instead of buying uh, many big machines, you buy many small machines with uh, kind of like as powerful as your laptop, which are all connected together into a device. So let's think of what the trade-offs are between these two approaches. So on the scaling up side, something that is very nice compared to what I used to have with my laptop is that I keep the same programming model. So I had my skin and program on my laptop, suddenly I have a machine with, say, 36 cores, and I can literally just go on Amazon uh, uh, EC2 and get that today. Uh, I'll still be able to run the same Python program, and it will be a lot faster. But there is some downsides, which are that it's going to cost me a lot of money. Uh, it's not very flexible. So if tomorrow the amount of data that I'm trying to process doubles, there's nothing I can do about it. It's, it's just stuck with this machine, and this is the biggest machine I can find. And also, it has a single point of failure. So if my machine breaks, suddenly my system goes down. On the other hand, I could scale out. So I could use many machines at once. And if you look at all the cons that we listed for scaling up, they kind of resolve by this scaling out. Suddenly, it's a lot cheaper uh, to run these small machines. It's a lot more flexible. If tomorrow my data, the amount of data I have doubles, I can double the size of my quest, and I'm happy. And it's all tolerant. I, 
I don't have a single point of failure anymore. If any of my machine fails, I still have all of the others, or like, like the fraction of the ones that I like, which are still going to be able to serve requests. But the big downside of this approach, and like, it shouldn't, it can't be emphasized enough that sometimes scaling up is the right choice because of this, is that suddenly I lose a lot of uh, programming model flexibility. My Python program that works really well on my single machine now doesn't work. Out. So what are we going to do about it? <coughs> so if you look at the image here, so we still have all of our machines, and what the Hadoop ecosystem lets you do, and this is uh, the system of the ecosystem we're going to be talking about in this talk, is kind of <coughs> like you just have one huge machine there instead of your cluster. It abstracts it in a way which makes it similar to a single machine. So you can think of some of the things that an operating system provides you and try to think and attach this to what Hadoop does that also provides the equivalent function. So let's say one of the lowest level things I want my operating system to do is a file system. I want to be able to have some sort of folder structure which is nested and hierarchical and to be able to store files in, uh, in here and delete them. And that's exactly what Hadoop HDFS does. It's worth noting that now uh, Amazon S3 is very popular and does something similar to And so I'm going to be listing some systems here. Something that's important to know is that they all have two big properties, which are the ones we want from the previous slide. One, it's scalable. So again, if I double the amount of uh, processing I have to do, and I also double the size of my cluster, things kind of take the same amount of time. And second, fault tolerance. If any of the machines in my cluster dies, or if any may be like two or three machines die in my cluster, I'm still able to perform just as well as I would. And this is because we have so many machines, it's very likely that some of them are going to die. Okay, so our file system, Hadoop uh, HDFS. Now, resource management is another thing we may want to provide. And this one is a little less obvious because you don't really see your operating system do it. And what it does is basically tell you. Um, so it, it looks at all of the machines you have, and it looks at all the calls you have, and all of the amounts of memory you have, and it'll be the, the uh, sort of framework responsible for saying, you get uh, 12 calls, so you get these six machines that each, each have two calls, with 200 megabytes of memory every time. And it'll be responsible for keeping track of which program owns which calls and which memory. And at the end, when the program finished, uh, terminates, it suddenly gives this, uh, these calls and this memory back away so that Yarm can give it to some other program. So finally, and this is kind of the equivalent of our Python program, at the top we have some data processing uh, programs. So we have Hadoop AppReduce and Apache Spark. <coughs> um, they both try to offer the same sort of abstraction. It turns out that Apache Spark is a more recent one that has a lot of pros. It's uh, because of good engineering, it's often faster, and also its uh, API is more flexible. And so that's what we're going to talk about in the rest of this talk. Sorry, so Hadoop is just a brand name? And the product is HDFS for Yarn or MapReduce. So Hadoop is a, I think, is a Nico system. That's what we do. Well, there's, there's, I think there's multiple things. I think initially Hadoop is just a kind of like, yeah, Hadoop, uh, the Hadoop uh, data file system, and Hadoop MapReduce were projects part of sort of the Hadoop ecosystem. Now, what people call the Hadoop ecosystem is a lot of other frameworks which weren't necessarily under the Hadoop Hadoop. Hadoop but also like kind of interface for them. So Apache Spark isn't, as far as I know, linked with Hadoop in itself, but just lets you interact with a lot of Hadoop Hadoop products very easily. Yeah? Um, I know, I don't have much experience with this, but I know that you can run Apache Spark and other resource managers. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. You can also use other file systems. Uh, yeah, so you're gonna use S3. We're actually gonna use S3 in our, in our uh, demo in a second. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, it well, can work with the Hadoop ecosystem, but it can also work, operate completely separately. That's right. I think the Hadoop ecosystem, like now, really you should see it as um, a set of open source frameworks which let you do uh, data, uh, like scaling out data processing, and that all like kind of fit together. But they don't all like, there's many sort of like pieces of the puzzles that are duplicated in, like there's multiple frameworks that are present. Cool. Um, so for example, we'll just use Spark just on my laptop, right, and I don't have HDFS on my laptop, so that's an example how you can Spark. So what we're going to do now is do a bit of live coding, just get a feel for the Spark API and what kind of operations we're able to, to do. And we're going to use a new fancy tool here called Zeppelin. 
And I think it's a brilliant logo. And what Zeppelin is, is essentially a thing like a Python notebook, so a bit of a REPL. You know, you, you type some code in here, one plus two, I'm sure we'll want to find out, and it gives you the, the result, okay? But the benefits it provides on top of Python notebook is that there is integrated support for different data visualizations, like generate pie charts or graph based on the data, and we'll use some of those tools, okay? So what we're going to do here is to use a data set from the open library. Uh, so basically a data set about all the kind of books that were published. It's a big JSON file. And here's a sample of them. It looks nice and ugly. <laughs> uh, but it's kind of a real world data set that you can download yourself. Uh, this is just a, a little sample here. You know, it's not very big, but the real one is about 100 gigabyte of data, okay? So the first thing we may wish to do is to first uh, load that stuff up. So this is how to invoke uh, Spark here. So what I'm going to call this is the raw data. So JSON file, I'm saying load it up. And you know, what we may wish to find out is how many, you know, how many elements there are in this file, right? So essentially what it does is how many lines there is in that JSON file. So notice that what's really nice is that we're completely decoupled from the uh, threading model or the processing model, right? We've got an API that sits on top of it. It's running locally on my machine, but I could take that same code and run it over a cluster of machines, right? We get a nice decoupling between the operations and the implementation. So here's a number of lines. Um, let's, uh, let's have a sneak peek about uh, what's, what's actually going on here. So the first entry, you can say it's a string, and that's uh, a line in that file, okay? So a beautiful book called The Effect of Differentiated Marking. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure we're going to read this book, but that sounds interesting. Um, so we've got a bunch of strings here. It requires us to be able to write uh, those objects as Python objects, right? Because we can see there is a title, there's languages. So at the moment, I just have a text string. So let's convert that stuff into um, Python object. So there's a nice module called a JSON, just to get, give you a feel on how this works. So let's say we've got a, some JSON data, which might be something like that. So name, and Dennis, is it D-E-I, like that, Zainab? Perfect. Two ends. Huh? Two ends. Two ends, so sorry. There we go. Perfect. And now what we wish to do is to be able to say, um, how do you convert that into a Python structure, okay? So now I've got a Python object, which means I can say something like that, you know, I've got a person, and I can extract its name. Okay, so now we've got a Python object. So what we want to do is convert each line in this file into Python objects, so we can operate them using Python, which ultimately is what we want. So there is a operation called map, available in Spark. And what that's gonna do is to apply a function on each element coming from that initial list, okay? So first, let's take a look at what, what, what raw data is. Uh, so you'll see it's kind of a special type here that's come from Spark. It's called an RDD. <coughs> what is RDD stand for? It's quite fancy. It's a, a resilient distributed data set. It's a very fancy name, but it really isn't necessary. Uh, what, what it stands for is some data set that it may be stored on multiple machines, maybe it's just on one machine, and has many distinct elements which you can do processing on. So think about it like a, like a, a Python list, but uh, more fancy and you know, the whole thing can be distributed. So the first thing we want to do is to convert each of those lines into Python objects. So we're going to map this and pass on this function, JSON.loads. So that's going to be uh, a new RDD. Okay. So if I do uh, rdd.count here, what we'll see is that actually uh, we have the same number of elements as before, right? So nothing changed here. But if we say, um, you know, take the first 10, okay? What you'll see is that now we actually get a list of Python objects. So we don't have strings anymore. So that's the nice win that we get, okay? Now, uh, Valentin. Uh, I'd like to, you know, we, we both live in Cambridge. I want to find out about books that have Cambridge in their title. How, how do you do this? Okay, so let's have a look. If I have an RDD, 
some operations that I can call on an RDD, uh, and again, this, if, if I'm on top of a cluster, this will be completely distributed, is filter. So I can do a filter, and what I'm going to pass here is a function. So you want to think that when uh, books that books the Cambridge in the title. So let's say, uh, so we're going to pass down a lambda function, which is going to return true if uh, there is uh, Cambridge in the title, and also the way. So lambda say D for book. And then we're first going to check that title is in uh, our, our in the entry that we have for that book, and that Cambridge is also in uh, is in the title of it. Okay. Yeah, we'll do a dot count. Just find out how many there are. Let's have a look. Seventy-six. Okay. So what if we want to get a little sample of the first five? Or so all we could do is take the first five, I guess. OK, so uh, let's have a look. Uh, a new Cambridge course. A new Cambridge, course. Cambridge English course. So you can see like all of these are actually books about Cambridge. But well, Valentine, it's a bit messy. All I really want here is just the, the titles. Can you just extract the titles for me? Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, we, 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 we did this filter operation. And what this really returns is another RDD. So we can still apply the same kind of operations onto this. So now maybe let's do a map. And uh, so we have all these 76 entries, and each of them are going to get, get processed individually. And we're going to pass a function again, so a lambda, which takes a book, and just returns the title of that book. We know that the book has a title because it already filled it out once, which didn't at the very beginning. So how do we, instead of finding the first five, how do you get all of them? Uh, if I call collect, it will just return the entire piece. So do you want me to collect all of this? Yeah. Let's go crazy. OK. So the new Cambridge English course, the new Cambridge English course, the new Cambridge English course. <laughs> it seems that this, this, this one may be there quite a few times. But, Clinical Governance Review of Cambridge and Peterborough Mental Health Partnership NHS Trust. Sign me up. <laughs> um, all right, so that's great. We can compose those operations together. That's fantastic. But you just mentioned the title. Are there the keys available in this data set? Let's kind of explore what sort of attributes are available uh, in a data set. Okay, cool. So maybe let's have a look at, uh, so we still have our RDD. Um, and let's have a look at how many, so each of them has a different, well, has a number of keys, right? Has some like sort of key value stores. And maybe let's have a look at for each, uh, so say how many of them have seven, <coughs> of, seven keys? How many of them have eight keys? How many of them have eight keys? <coughs> First of all, let's get all those keys, right? Let's see oh, okay, just what all those keys are all okay. about. Okay, so uh, all that we need to do is RDD, uh, so if we call it flat map, so this is another operation like map and filter. Uh, where what we return for each book is going to be the keys in that book. And the reason we use flat map here is because keys is going to return a, a, a list of things, right? So if we've got map, you end up having a, a list of a list of a list of a list of stuff, which is not really useful. So we can flatten all those into the list using flat map. So exactly. So with the flat map that I'm doing at the very bottom here, um, I'm each for each book, I'm going to get many entries corresponding to all of the keys that this book has. Before we had something like 100,000 books, so maybe now our RT is going to have like a million entries or something like that. And then what I'm calling is distinct. So now distinct is going to remove all of the duplicate entries. And then I'll call dot collect or dot count. Maybe dot count first to just make sure it's not true. Uh, yeah. Okay, so there are 77 keys in total, um, types of keys. What about collect actually? Okay, let's, 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 see. let's have a look at Maybe some interesting. So we should, we, should, we should emphasize, this is a very messy data set, and uh, like some keys are duplicated in, with different names. So we, what do we have? We have the publisher, the death date of the author, uh, number of pages, uh, covers, edition names. So you can see the death date. <laughs> this one seems a little... All right. Uh, um, interesting. Well, um, but Valentin, what about the distribution of the skills? Because as you mentioned, it might be a messy data. They've said maybe not all books have a death date. Yeah, that's uh, true. So let's get a bit of a distribution out of this. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is to uh, see how many, uh, to map these books from having 
uh, from just a, a store of uh, key values to something that tells us about the number of keys they have. So uh, we're going to call length of uh, V of keys. And then the second thing we're going to call, that's right. Uh, and then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to return uh, so length, length of keys and then one. And this one is going to make sense in a second as I do the second operation. So that's a tuple that we've got going on here. Yeah. Okay, so number of times the keys, or the number of keys we've got for a specific book, and then the occurrence of one. So then the operation I'm going to call, and it's worth noting that what I'm doing here is actually exactly what MapReduce is. So like MapReduce is kind of like a computation pattern, and the computation pattern I'm using here is exactly MapReduce. And so let's have a look. I've called reduce by key, and then I've passed a function which takes two integers, or two numbers, x and y, and returns x plus one. And so what I'm doing here is, in the first step, I'm listing as key the number of entries that uh, that book record has. So maybe this book had just title and death date, just these two entries, and so that was a two. And maybe another one had four, so it ended up with something like two, one, and four, one. Now, that two, or two of two, one, is gonna become a key, and I'm gonna add up all of the key, all of the ones that are associated with that key. So if I have a two, one somewhere, a two, one elsewhere, and a final two, one at the very bottom, I'm gonna get three of them, and what I'm going to end up with as I reduce by key is a two and then a three, because that all these three ones are going to have been summed. So maybe, let's see, uh, I should call dot uh, collect. collect here. Let's maybe store this to a variable so we can uh, iterate of the, the results as well. Uh, so uh, something like count the key. Yep, count the uh, key. Cool. So let's print out what that looks let's like. Let's just display the variable, yeah, it's very feel for it. Uh, okay, so. Okay, so we can see kind of what it looks like. It says uh, there are 6,976 entries which have 25 keys. There's 1,411 of them which have been. Valentine, you know, I'm not really a text guy. I like pretty, pretty graphs and visuals just so I can understand a bit about the data. So, have you got something uh, more interesting, maybe integrated in Zeppelin? So, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, it turns out Zeppelin actually has a really neat way to, uh, like, a very easy way to print data. Um, so, what I'm telling here is, I'm. Print, um, Telling them to, okay, so I'm about to give you a table, and then I just uh, pass down the table. So for each entry uh, in uh, count the key, uh, and then what I'm going to print here is um, so using a bit of Python syntax. So percentage d, this is a decimal, and I'm going to pass two of them with a backslash t in the middle, and this is something to tell them to. There's two percentage d's, the, the two decimals that I need to uh, give, and those are going to be d of 0 and d of 1. So normally you might be using some of the lib to do all the work for you, but here, if we run this code. OK, so we have a table. It's not that much better than having it printed it before. But now what we can do is ask Zeppelin to just uh, print it as a histogram. And suddenly we can see for each number of keys, for, for each, uh, so there are that many books that have been, you can see we have a mode around sort of two. So you can see that Zeppelin quite quickly lets you interact and print data. My favorite is the pie chart though. The pie chart? Yeah. It? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So you see, we can see 21 is a winner. It is a winner. So Valentin, we've just done this processing locally, so you know, a sample of the data set just to get a feel for it. Let's take this you know, to the next level. Let's go with uh, about 100 gigabyte of data. How are we going to do this? OK, so here again, this was just on a laptop. And this is because we had a small subset of the data. But if you have, we actually look at the entirety of the data, so we've uploaded the, the data to a nest 3 container, it's actually uh, um, 
So S3 is this uh, service provided by Amazon where you can upload a data set. And it's kind of like HDFS, which I was mentioning before. The data set will be replicated in many places, and it'll be really quick to access it. And so you can see it's 92 gigabytes. This is uh, the same kind of thing with the book. Um, and OK, so now, now that we have this uh, data uploaded online, how do we play with it in a scalable way? How do, can we grab many? Uh, how can we grab many? Uh, should we have a look? Okay. Uh, so first, maybe just okay. so we don't spoil the the surprise, we actually have a, a Zeppelin notebook here running on top of something called EMR that Valentin is going to chat about in a second. Same code as before, right? We but instead of loading from uh, the local a local file, we're loading from S3. So we're just going to run this code, and you said starting, and we'll come back to it in a second. So what is EMR? So EMR, Amazon EMR, stands for Amazon Elastic MapReduce. And it's a new service, or rather recent service, provided by Amazon. And the idea is that, so before we had Amazon EC2, which just lets you uh, spawn machines, EMR also sets up your machine so that you have all of the frameworks that you want. So for example, if you have Spark, you can have Spark. If you want Hadoop, you can have Hadoop. Uh, and you can see here there's example of, examples of many more, HBEST, Base, Presto, Hive, uh, which you may have heard of. So let's have a look. So if I sign into the console, I can see I have a list of services, and a recently visited one is EMR. So let's click on the So you can see, so here we have um, a set of clusters we've already loaded. But maybe let's have a look at what would happen if we wanted to create a cluster. Because it's beautiful names here. Slow. So if you, so we've actually it takes maybe like a five ten minutes for a cluster to boot. So we can, uh, we're not doing this live. But let's have a look at what happens if we didn't want to create a cluster right now. So as you may imagine, so we can talk about. How do you do? Come on. The joys of the Mac. Um, so, so you can set a cluster name, which is simple, the launch mode. And then something which is quite neat is that first you can set which, um, which frameworks you want. So here it's giving you a couple sort of sensible configurations where at the top one you have to do a hive, a pick, test. The one we so picked. Sorry, so sorry, okay. when you say the loop, does that mean like all the structures from the file, HDFS, YARN? I think that's right, yeah. That's what the yeah, I think it's uh, all of so it's. I think there's three of them. There's H, yeah, so it's HDFS, CRM, and MapReduce. I think that's it. So if I see that in the core balance system, yeah. Um, so the one we picked was the sorry, one. Sorry, this will install it on my, on my laptop. Oh no, sorry, sorry. Let's clarify. So what this is going to do is it's going to spawn many uh, instances in the cloud and it's in um, the Amazon data center, and all of them will have this setup. So. Yeah, so here we have a uh, couple of different configurations. I think if I really want to, I can actually select exactly which ones I'm picking. So I can ask for Spark and Presto or something like this if I want to. So it's kind of like the stack that you want to set up. And then below, we can configure what kind of instance type you'd like to have. So a particular machine with a 16 gigabyte of RAM, for example, and four cores, and then the number of those instances that you want to have. And that's your cluster. So for example, when we actually spawned it, I think earlier we spawned 16 machines. So it tells you there's going to be one master machine, which is going to be the one coordinating everything, and 15 core nodes. And you can set up the, as Raul mentioned, the instance types. If we wanted to go crazy, we could set up, pick the largest of the C ones. Uh, this one, which I think has the six cores, um, we didn't go for that one. OK, so now let's have a look at what happens. So as we said, uh, this was created before. So well, we, we spawned a uh, cluster before. So let's have a look uh, now. Something that's really neat is that if you just go on this page, you can see here we have a list of connections. And these are links that we can click to just directly have a look. So you know that Zeppelin notebook that we had open before? The, the way we opened it was very simple. We just clicked it. And this opens my Zeppelin notebook, which is on top of my distributed list of 16 machines. Um, well, final time. Is that, do we actually have 16 machines running? You know, we can actually check this by going to EC2. And with a bit of luck, we'll see that we've got 19 running instances. Uh, and drag this thing down. You see, that's all the machines that were spinned up, right? 
So again, I should check that because it's on your EC2 account. Um, all right, so let's have a look at, you remember we did a query where we counted the number of lines in that uh, 92 gigabyte file. So, oh, it's still working. Uh, it started four minutes ago. Um, and it's at 64%. But something that we should be able to see now is in the list of all of these uh, servers, there's Ganglia, which is really neat. It tells you, uh, it's sort of like monitoring the performance of all of your machines in your cluster. So if we click on Ganglia, we can see that as we asked our count, suddenly all of our, the, the cluster, our CPU usage ramped straight up over there. And uh, if we go down, we can see uh, the, the load also increased. So this, this kind of tells you, are your machines saturated or are you wasting resources? Uh, the memory hasn't changed much. And the reason is, actually, it's doing this in memory because Again, to speed things up for this tutorial, we've loaded the data set in memory before. Um, so, it's teasing us. So, it takes about uh, you know, six minutes to, to run. Uh, but again, the win that you get with, uh, with Spark and using something like EMR is that we've decoupled ourselves from the execution model so we can take the same code that we're working with locally and run it over a cluster. So that's a great way, and from an integration point of view, Spark support, you know, it's, there's an API in Python, and Scala, and Java, so if those are technologies that you use uh, at work, then there's a quite a simple conceptual kind of a migration to something like Spark, because it's good support, yes? Yeah, I'm just about EMR. How easy is it to install in your packages or set a to an image that's going to be spun up in your cluster? So by a custom image, do you mean a um, like one with exactly the, the uh, things you want? To okay, so some a custom Python package. So I thought I may be misled. I thought they actually let you set up uh, a base AMI. Um, so do you know what an AMI is? Yeah. Uh, so so like it's an AMI is sort of a, uh, an image that actually stands for Amazon Match an Image of. Uh, so I may. So sort of install some things on a virtual machine on a on an Amazon instance, and then sort of save this so that I can load an exact version of that machine at any time. I thought I, you could set up a base AMI uh, for to check that it will install those. That's right. Yeah. There's also ways to hook up uh, on the starter of your cluster, so when the master has started up, there's ways to load some scripts at that point. It's a bit more complicated than this, and perhaps uh, as well. <coughs> Great, so it's finished. So this is the answer. Awesome. <laughs> uh, great. This is how many lines you have in that 92 gigabyte file. So let's, uh, we'll just wrap up the talk. Um, so we talked about EMR. And you know, one thing to really consider here, we, we've just used a gigantic JSON file. Right? So JSON is kind of like a data file format that is used a lot in practice. And our use case here was, here's some JSON files, just process it and find some answer and throw it away. But in practice, you'll often get a win by you know, converting your data into something like Parquet. So there was a talk about Parquet this morning, which is quite a nice data file format, which has support for different codings, can be compressed as well, to reuse, would reduce the, the size of the file, which means there's less transfer between the different machines, so you get a nice performance win from that front. And specific queries are going to be run more efficiently using something like Parquet, but it's a columnar kind of uh, data format. So that's something to keep in consideration. There's also quite a cool new tech uh, appearing these days, uh, approximate querying systems. And what those guys do, which is pretty amazing, they say, hey, you know, here's petabytes of information, you can query that within a second or two. And the way they do it is by just having a sample of the data that's indexed, and you query that sample. So it's kind of a, an error rate, but that might be perfectly reasonable for uh, certain kind of business queries. If you're doing business intelligence, you know, often you don't really cover the really exact result, but just kind of an indication of what it is. So that's stuff to, to look at as well. So a quick plug. Uh, so Cambridge Spark, we provide professional development training for data scientists, aspiring data scientists and developers. We provide different courses publicly, so you can sign up, come over a weekend, also in the house on things like machine learning, big data analytics, NLP. Uh, we have a six-month program running in London. 
where basically uh, we help you transition to become a data scientist. So that's quite a, it requires a lot of commitment. And finally, it'd be great to see some of you guys in Cambridge. We're running the Cambridge Data Science Summit in partnership with the Sanger Institute. So it's a big uh, research center for genetics uh, analysis. Uh, we've got different speakers and workshops as well. So, thanks for coming to our talk. And Dennis, a bit of a round of applause for Dennis. <laughs>